Our Old Testament this reading this morning is from the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 30, beginning in verse 9, reading to verse 14. Let us listen together for God's word to us today. And the Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors. When you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. In the New Testament, we read from the letter to the Colossians in chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, you have heard of this hope before in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it, is, it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you, may, may you be made strong with all the strength that comes from His glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is good to be back with you after three Sundays now of being away. Uh, two of those on either side of the Presbyterian General Assembly. Uh, and one of those as a vacation week needed after the Presbyterian General Assembly. Um, although as I, as I shared in the Sunday school class this morning, uh, I came away from the week uh, actually feeling energized about the work of the church, feeling hopeful as we go forward, and thankful for the voice of uh, Foothills Presbytery and uh, that our voice was heard. Um, at the General Assembly in Portland, Oregon. But it is good to be back with you. I missed you, and I'm, I'm glad to be back um, in Greenville and at 4th and in worship with you today. Particularly because it has been a heart-wrenching and mind-numbing week in our nation. It is painful to take an honest look at the communities of our country, 
as we are being forced to do. Uh, and that is to take an honest look at ourselves and to acknowledge that there are racial tensions among us that still fester and racial bias and sometimes even bigotry and hatred that still infects the hearts of many. Uh, it is true that America has made important progress towards racial justice in many ways, but as we are seeing, we still have much work to do to realize the harmony that we long for. We cannot hide from these horrific scenes that go viral on the internet, most recently the shootings of Alton, Ster Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge and Philando Castile in the Twin Cities, and then the police officers gunned down by a lone sniper in Dallas as they sought to serve and protect peaceful protesters. Videos like these certainly do not tell the whole story, and there is important investigative work still to do in each case, and it is true that these tragic acts make the news while the good work of good people and good law enforcement officers so often goes untold. I will be interested to see whether the peaceful resolution of the confrontation last night, a few blocks from here at Bon Secours Arena in front of it, if that will be carried by the national news. Um, no doubt peaceful protests, civil disobedience, and nonviolent resolution are happening all around our country without sufficient media coverage. It happened late enough last night not to make the paper, um, but you may have seen things on the internet about it. Nevertheless, all these stories reveal a deep and pervasive illness that infects us as a people. We are experiencing a crisis of trust, a pathology rooted in fear that in the worst cases gives way to hatred and the acting out of hatred in violence toward one another. Our world is a mess. Now we could shrug it off and say, preacher, the world has always been a mess. This is nothing new. And there would be truth in that. But we may also recognize that there are times when the flood of the world's chaos reaches a high watermark and calls for new action and greater urgency on the part of the church. If the church does not listen intently for a word from the Lord in a time like this, when will we ever listen? If the church does not find a word from the Lord to speak to the world in a time like this, when will we ever speak? The book of Deuteronomy tells us that enjoying the prosperity of the land is a two-way street. Prosperity comes to us as a blessing from the hand of God, but God calls upon us to live lives of justice. When we follow the ways of justice set down by God in the law, then God will bless us with abundant life, says Deuteronomy. The fruit of abundance comes to us when we seek to live our lives in accord with God's purpose for human life. Of course, we know that life is not always as cut and dried as this. It is not always as simple as this doctrine of abundance in Deuteronomy. Because sin is infectious, even, the heart, even in the hearts of those with the very best intentions. And evil is insidious and creeps into every human community. And fear overshadows us and our hearts are taken captive by what Paul calls the power of darkness. So how is it in such a mess of a world that this letter to the Colossians can begin with such cheerfulness? In a world of violence and atrocity like ours, and the world of the first century was no less of a mess, how can Christians speak with such thankfulness and generosity and grace? How can Christians live out of love and sustain faith and work for peace in a world like this? Now, we shouldn't get the wrong idea about the situation in the Colossian church because Paul begins with such gracious words. There were problems in the Colossian church. There were divisions in the church over which teachers to follow. There were some who condemned others for not being pure enough. There were some who cast off humility and spoke with great hubris about their superior knowledge of God. 
there were those who fostered such divisions in the church, trying to play them to their own advantage. These were troubled times for the Colossians, and yet, even so, Paul's letter to the Colossian church begins with thanksgiving to God. In our prayers to you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. Somehow in the midst of this, faith and love were still growing in the Colossian church. How is that? The apostle tells them it is because of the hope because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. And just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, Paul says, so it has been bearing fruit among you, among yourselves from the day that you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. We have heard of your faith and your love, Paul says, because you are living according to the hope of the gospel. This gospel grounded hope that inspired the Colossian church to deeply rooted faith and broadly reaching love is not some pie in the sky, by and by wishfulness that distracts their attention from the world. No, this gospel grounded hope is the bedrock assurance that God is already at work to fulfill the gospel so that that future fulfillment is as good as done and the Colossians can get to work in the present living with great confidence. Their confidence in what God is doing right in the middle of this chaotic world and broken church sets them free from fear to love one another, to love all the saints, not just the ones they like or agree with, but all the saints. This gospel-grounded hope enables them to look at the mess of the world and to see the rising waters of the world's chaos and to say, nevertheless, nevertheless, the gospel is bearing fruit in the world, even in those places that seem completely overrun with corruption and violence and greed. We believe the gospel of God's grace is bearing fruit in the world, and we want to be a part of that growth. Friends in Christ, because of the hope that is laid up for us in heaven, the hope we have heard from the word of truth, the gospel, we too can live in a tumultuous world and a conflicted church and trust that God's word is still at work and bearing fruit among us. Because of our hope, the church has a word to proclaim, good news to proclaim, in a world racked by fear and infected with hatred and embroiled in violence. Because of our hope, we have good reason to become engaged in our local community and to work for the well-being and dignity of all who live here, regardless of race or wealth or even their citizenship status, because the law of God speaks of that too. Because of our hope, we reach out to one another when we're facing trials and hardships, and we offer hands to help, and shoulders to cry on, and arms to embrace, and ears to hear their stories. Because of our hope, we build relationships with our neighbors, as we strive to do with our neighbors in the Sterling community, as we strive to do with our homeless neighbors who come to the Triune Mercy Center, as we strive to do with our neighbors right here beside us in these pews. Fifty years ago, when the tumult of racial tension in our country had reached a great crescendo, to the point that our problems could not be ignored, the Presbyterian General Assembly, meeting in Portland, Oregon, adopted the Confession of 1967. The Confession of 1967 proclaims, drawing on later verses in this first chapter of Colossians, that in Jesus Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself 
and that God's reconciling work in Jesus Christ and the mission of reconciliation to which he has called the church are at the heart of the gospel in every age. The Confession of 1967 in our Presbyterian Book of Confessions says, our generation stands in particular need of reconciliation. Apparently this peculiar need, particular need, still exists 50 years later. Two weeks ago, once again meeting in Portland, Oregon, the Presbyterian General Assembly took the final vote in a three-year process to adopt the Belhar Confession, which grew out of the witness of the church in South Africa against apartheid. Belhar is primarily a call to the church to be a living demonstration of the unity, reconciliation, and justice that God intends for all people. So the Confession of 1967 is primarily focused on reconciliation in the world, and Belhar is primarily focused on reconciliation in the church. And friends, we have work to do in both places, in the world and in the church. And it is because of the hope we have in Christ Jesus that we can do this work with confidence. The new stated clerk of the Presbyterian Church USA, J. Herbert Nelson, wrote this week about racial tensions in our country. He wrote that the time is right to act. The time has always been right to act, he says. And the actions of the General Assembly have no meaning, he says, unless we as people of faith act to eradicate racism in our nation. Our efforts must begin in our own communities and require courage. I couldn't agree more. And so I ask, what are we being called to do as a congregation in downtown Greenville, South Carolina, to work against racism in our community. I think we begin with conversations with one another. And in the fall, when we gather once again um, for study, I am planning to do a study of the Confession of 1967 and the Belhar Confession as at least a beginning for us to have this work conversation about the work we're being called to do together. In 1963, Eugene Carson Blake, then stated clerk of the Presbyterian Church, spoke at the March on Washington. He said, quote, the white church is late, but we are here now. Friends, Let's not be late. Let's be here now. Why? Because of the hope laid up for us in heaven. Because of the word of truth, the gospel that is very near to us. And the word that is right now bearing fruit in the whole world. And that we pray will bear fruit among us so that we may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to God. Amen.